Everybody, welcome to um, a special edition of our uh, weekly vascular conference uh, and seminar. Uh, we, these, uh, we have these uh, once a week. Before we had the internship, um, we would have visiting people talk and give more like a grand rounds format. But today we have a pretty special guy, at least in my opinion, um, who um, we're going to pink, pick his brain a little bit, a couple of a one what he, it's one case, both case of what he would do, how he'd manage them. One's a complication, which I already actually told him about. And um, the other one is a, an inter another interesting case. And then we'll spend the rest of it talking about Mike's career and um, you know some thoughts he might and uh, ideas he might have for the student group that is joining us today, which pr numbers probably close to a thousand on the, our Instagram feed. So with that, I just want to introduce Mike Lawton, who is the, uh, CEO of the Barrow uh, Neurological Institute and the chairman there. Mike uh, is a brilliant guy, went to uh, Johns Hopkins um, Medical School after going to Brown University and then trained in uh, his neurosurgery residency at the Barrow, uh, you know, moved, moved out west after meeting Robert Spetzler, who is the founder, of the, more or less the founder of the current Barrow. And then Mike spent the better part of his career at UCSF and really built up a reputation I think it genera generationally is, I think, the leading uh, vascular, if not neurosurgeon of our generation. Um, and I looked up to Michael and, and asked him for advice and guidance over many cases over many years. I was lucky enough to get to know him at a ski meeting and we've become uh, quite close. And uh, I think his hard work, ethic, creativity, and vision are essential to uh, student success um, going forward. So with that, um, Mike, I'm going to um, show you a few cases. Um, and I'm going to ask you to uh, comment. I don't know if you have anything to say at the beginning. If you wanted to just take the, the podium for a few minutes and give us a little background and some early thoughts that we can get right into the cases. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> thank you, David, uh, for the kind introduction. Um, and uh, let me just begin by congratulating all of you. I think um, uh, the success of your Netflix show has been breathtaking. I um, remember when David, uh, when, when you first mentioned it to me at uh, in Jackson Hole, I thought, ah, Netflix, that, that sounds interesting, but this can't amount to much. But uh, to see the uh, actual series, and I've watched the entire thing, um, I've seen um, uh, the success uh, nationwide. I, the, the, the thing that really impressed me the most was that I think the day that the series dropped on Netflix, I looked up Langer's Twitter followers, <laughs> and I think it was just shy of 2,000. And last I looked, I think it was about 15,000. It's probably 20,000 by now. None of my, my, my kids think I'm cool. <laughs> so um, I, I think it's just spectacular. I think um, you guys have um, put together a, an amazing group. I told David this about a week ago. Um, it is so refreshing uh, to see a very tight-knit group of neurosurgeons come together to feel um, so bonded to one another, to be invested in each other's success, to um, just um, authentically share this, uh, this journey that you're on together. Um, I, I think it, it comes across in the show. Um, it's great to see it. I know it's the real deal. And um, you know, I congratulate you on really um, making something out of um, out of nothing, really. I don't think most of us knew anything about Lenox Hill a few years ago, and you guys have really not only put it on the map, but uh, become a real force in neurosurgery. Well, I appreciate that, and I, I think that um, the Netflix show, in all honesty, is more of a. It's all luck. I was luck. I think the the the, the, the structure and the ethic and the gr group we had here. You know, when they came to us, I, I knew we were legit and we, 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 um, we were able to translate. The fact that we could translate that the way it is, that's just crazy. You know, that's uh, more than you could ever hope for. And, I, you know, I, I felt a little uncomfortable about being about, you know, me in particular, uh, particularly at the beginning. Uh, but I think the way it came out and the contribution that pretty much all of our faculty made and hopefully maybe may do again, uh, really it can shine through and we were, you know, we were really blessed and lucky to and humbled by it. You know, it's been a great. Yeah, I, I would echo that. I think um, 
you are incredibly lucky. I mean, for someone who's known more for his complications than his uh, surgical prowess, the fact that they would make a show <laughs> based around you is really quite. Uh, Thank you so much. Okay, but that will finish the panel. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, it, it's so well deserved. I, I, um, I've known David now for for decades, <clears throat> and for so many of those years, I would listen to to Dave um, complain about this personality or this broad deal or this um, whatever. I mean, it was one one shaft after the next, and it just seemed like nothing could go David's way. Even even the story of the Alana. <laughs> was uh, emblematic of Dave, of your choices in life, and and now to see this, your your luck has totally turned, and everything's coming up roses, and uh, uh, I just think it's so well deserved. You've waited a long time. Fa failure is uh, important, as we all know. <laughs> yes, it is. So, hey, is we have baby. We have a question through the chat. Do you want to address that? Go ahead, ask him. So this for Dr. Lott, and he says, can you discuss your time at Brown University and the transition to Johns Hopkins? You were actually manifesting where I want to go in life and what I want to do. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the, uh, well, um, as you know, Brown is kind of a, a unique place. Um, it's much more liberal and um, freewheeling than some of the other Ivies. Um, I was an engineer in college, and um, <clears throat> I uh, studied biomedical engineering, and uh, um, was on a campus where you know it was really fun to be. I really enjoyed it. Um, I think um, going from that environment um, to Johns Hopkins was really a, a complete 180. Hopkins is very um, old school, uh, very traditional. Uh, my grandfather went to Hopkins back in the 20s. Um, I, I still have his old musty. Osler textbooks on my shelf, um, and and it's it's that kind of a place. It's so steeped in history and tradition, and um, regiment. Um, so the two were were really opposite. But um, honestly, I think the combination is great. I think it's so nice to have um, a place where you can really come into your own in college and be who you want to be, um, study what you want to study in college, and and just explore all that, and then. When it's time to really put your nose to the grindstone, have a place like Hopkins where you just um, soak up the culture and soak up the tradition and um, learn of all the heroes who used to walk the halls. It was really a nice combination for me. Um, that said, you know, I do think um, you go from, well, e each place that I've been to, whether it's Brown to Hopkins and Hopkins to here, uh, the Barrow, it it's, it's, a huge leap. You go from a place that's a certain way and you go to another place that's usually a big cultural shift and to go from Hopkins to Barrow where um, you know probably 90 percent of the people in my graduating medical school class had never heard of Barrow, wondered why I was going to Phoenix, Arizona, thought that I had uh, gotten screwed up in the match somehow. Uh, it, it's a it's a big um, cultural shift and uh, you know I think you just have to be um, ready as you go through your career to adapt to all of these different cultures and these different twists of fate. I was going to say, I'll, I'll ask you to ask the question, then maybe each of the guys will talk a little about this. I mean, I think that, um, I know after hearing your story that people kind of said, where are you going to the Barrow? Like, you know, you, you made some good decisions, but that was a risk. I mean, and it, especially given your, you know, your kind of ethic and you were East Coast Ivy League, kind of, you know, uh, background, um, you were sort of giving up on something. And, and, and I think you can just, you can describe the, the effect Robert had on you, but, you know, I think that that was a risk and, um, you took the, without those, these risks and without making these, you know, commitments, you never can be as successful as you would have otherwise been. If you done, if you always do what everybody's telling you to do, um, and always, you know, worried about what are people thinking of your decisions, I think you end up, Maybe that was my mistake early on, you know, just trusting that everybody was people looking out for me when it was more or less the opposite. So that, that, describe that for us. Yeah, I, I, it's a great, great point. I, I think one of the hardest decisions that I ever made in my life, at least up until that point, was the uh, decision to, to go to the Barrow because um, you, it's so true. You leave um, this um, really well-known uh, traditional place on the East Coast. It's completely established, has a long history, 
everybody recognizes it, to go to a place that nobody's heard of. And um, that was a real, it was a huge leap. And I think um, um, uh, it's a leap that a lot of people who decide to come to a place like the BNI um, or others like it have to make. And I think um, uh, if I hadn't been able to make that, I would have been a different person and had a totally different career. I can tell you that um, at the time I was really uh, enamored with Hopkins. I felt like I wanted to stay at Hopkins. And if I had stayed there, I um, would not have had the career that I have today. Um, my career changed when I met Dr. Spetzler and um, I uh, learned how to do a type of neurosurgery that's totally different than what I would have learned in Baltimore. Um, and uh, it, it, it would have been a different life. And so I think there's some truth to that idea that you have to be willing to um, take the risk and to um, essentially walk the plank and take a leap uh, from time to time and trust um, that it's not really about the prestige or um, the, um, the accolade. It's about the, um, the deed that you're doing. You know, it's not, it's not the, um, um, the recognition, but it's, it's the uh, ability to um, uh, do that special something. And, and in my case, it was trained in neurosurgery. I, I came out here as a medical student, a wide-eyed medical student, and I saw things that I'd never seen before. Uh, procedures that were being done here, anatomical triangles I'd never heard of, um, a, a feeling of the culture that was um, totally different than anything I'd experienced on the East Coast. And I thought, you know what? I've done the East. I, I know what that's about. I'm going to do something totally different. And um, it turned out to be a, a life-changing decision for me. Well, well um, yeah, I was going to say, guys, you want to have anything to add about what you might have, the things you might have done? Yeah, who would you say were your neurosurgical mentors besides Dr. Spetzler, I guess, while you were a um, medical student and maybe early in your career? Yeah, um, it's... Um, been really fun as a chairman because I have been able to invite every one of those people who I hold very dear to me uh, back here as a uh, visiting professor and to kind of honor them as uh, being a mentor. And the first one is Henry Brem. You know, when I was a medical student at Hopkins, um, Henry kind of took me in and um, he uh, taught me science. Um, he uh, got me hooked on neurosurgery. Uh, he was a wonderful human being. He still is. Um, to this day, we still confer on things. And um, he really um, convinced me that neurosurgery is what I wanted to do. He also convinced me that I, I should be a brain tumor surgeon. And I believe that. I was, uh, I was studying angiogenesis in his laboratory. I was uh, reading up on all these esoteric brain tumors and this and that. And that's really what I came to Phoenix thinking I would become. Uh, until I met Dr. Spetzler, and of course, he was uh, my second huge mentor, and um, he kind of spun my life backwards and uh, got me going in the vascular direction. Um, but the third mentor who I, I think is really important to me um, is Mitch Berger. You know, I think Mitch um, obviously hired me out of my residency and for 20 years um, created an environment for me where I could basically grow and become who I am. Um, he gave me control from day one of the department of the uh, division of vascular, open vascular. Um, he supported me in my work, uh, in my research. He um, brought attention to my work. He gave me opportunities to speak at podiums, to go to meetings, to um, do all that stuff when you're really a nobody uh, that a good chairman will do to get you recognition and support. Um, so I, those are the three, I think, most important people in my uh, in my career, and then obviously the list keeps going from there. But um, but those three really um, profoundly changed um, my my career path. Raf Yaffel, how many thoughts or questions? Oh, um, going to the point of of mentors, I th I think that's a a great point for the students that are listening. Um, we all. Uh, make the dece career decisions uh, uh, based on what we know and who we know. And, and having people that influence us is critical uh, to that keep, uh, that keep us thinking and uh, being inquisitive about 
uh, the career choices and, and how to, to navigate from uh, college to medical school, to residency, to fellowship, to a practice, to a career. And uh, uh, that's, I think all of us here have had that type of, uh, uh, of influence uh, uh, in us. And, and, and now, uh, some more than others, depending on the stage of the career, we are having that type of influence in, in other people now. And it's a huge responsibility. Um, uh, and for Dr. Lawton, when, when you as a chairman and an educator, what's your uh, philosophy at the time when, when you have residents and fellows? Uh, uh, we have many people that are listening today, more than students. I can see that from the questions, we have even residents that are listening to our conversation here. Uh, what is uh, your philosophy in terms of uh, training in cerebrovascular? Uh, how hands-on does a resident need to be learning how to clip uh, an aneurysm? Uh, how hands-on a fellow has to be how to uh, uh, operate on ABM surgery? Um, and at the same time, what should be the approach for a young cerebrovascular surgeon who's trying to develop a career in the time when endovascular devices are growing exponentially. And because of that, more and more and more people are doing endovascular and less cases are going to open vascular surgery. Um, great, uh, great topic. It really is um, one that I'm asked a lot and I think all of us uh, are asked a lot about this. Um, I, I think I'll start by saying this, I think, um, the way I look at it now, um, now that I'm a chairman and I'm responsible for 28 residents and uh, um, six or so fellows, um, it, it's, um, I tell them all, all the time that you have to uh, build your narrative. I think this whole process that you're talking about is about building a narrative. And um, what I mean by that is that we're, we're all this blank canvas and you have to just start throwing paint on the canvas and see how it starts to look. And um, I tell people, you know, um, just start to, to weave a story, you know, do things with your time that are gonna build this narrative. And um, that's really about making a collection of different experiences, putting together a collection of different projects, uh, traveling to different places to see different types of mentors and allowing yourself to um, be, uh, influenced by the, the winds of fate. Um, sometimes, as in my story, um, you know, the winds of fate blow you in a completely different direction. And I think you have to be open to that. Um, other times, you know, you just get a gust of wind that pushes you in the same direction. And I, I think um, this idea of building a narrative is really important because it gets, I think it gets people to think about how they're using their time. Seven years goes by so fast. And, um, you think it's an eternity when you're in a residency program, but um, by the time you're done getting through these prescribed rotations and doing a couple of projects uh, on research, you know, it's over. And um, uh, as far as the training is concerned, um, I, I think everybody's different. I think um, um, what, what I try and do is to mold people. Um, and sometimes you have to mold them by letting them do a lot. Other times you have to mold them by getting them to think in a different way. Um, other times you need to mold them by just getting them completely away from neurosurgery and connecting outside. And um, I think it's, it's a real challenge to find some way to make that connection. Um, uh, I, I do think um, it's harder now uh, today for open vascular neurosurgeons to, um, to get the training that they need and want. Um, you know, I have four chief residents and a fellow um, that's a lot of mouths to feed around a, a trough, and um, there's a lot of hungry mouths. So it, it does become a challenge to get um, uh, the cases up. But I think, um, you know, uh, becoming a, a really um, uh, star neurosurgeon is really, it's not always about uh, doing the most cases. I, um, I think some of the, the, the most influential moments that I had as a resident were just um, you know, uh, trying to soak up as much of what I could from watching Dr. Spetzler um, and just 
getting every little thing I could. It, it, it was like um, a bucket of pearls and you could just, your goal was to just try and ingest as much of that as you possibly could. Um, and so I would, you know, try and finish one case and get to his next case so I could, I could see. And it wasn't always about doing it. It was about just um, um, being there to see how um, he dealt with things. So um, anyway, it, it, that narrative can be built so many different ways. I think people who are fixated on, well, geez, how many, how many cases did I do this month? Or how many aneurysms did I clip uh, this quarter? Um, that, that can be misleading. I think you really have to think, OK, What's my narrative? Am I moving in that direction? Um, how, how can I best get there? Um, it's not always about you know, wielding the knife. It's about um, being clever, being creative, and finding that, um, that special uh, niche that you can fill. There's some questions in the audience. Um, uh, read, there's one I liked. Uh, one thing about it says, uh, surgeons who've reached the pinnacle of your field, how do you balance holding on the gravity of what neurosurgery entails while also maintaining uh, a, a, a good attitude? And how do you deal with work-life balance? Um, yeah, well, um, I think it's, it's very um, easy to uh, always remember the gravity of what we do because um, particularly as, as David knows, um, uh, vascular neurosurgery humbles you very quickly. And if ever you get too confident, if ever you get overconfident um, and get too full of yourself, there's always a case uh, or a situation that will humble you very quickly. Um, so um, remembering the gravity of what we do is, is actually not so difficult for me. I do think that um, the work-life balance is a real struggle. Um, the problem is it's a happy problem. We, we love what we do. And what we're given the opportunity to do is just so special that we can easily become addicted and consumed. Um, I think that's my biggest problem is that, um, you know, I, I, I love what I do. I, I enjoy the technical challenges, um, the heart of the case, the, the bigger the AVM, uh, the more I am challenged by that. And so I, I, um, I really get sucked in and I have to, um, find ways to pull back. Um, and, uh, that for me has been family. Um, that for me has been um, a second home where I'm, I literally have to get out of town and get away. Um, the, for me, it's been sports like skiing and mountain biking. Um, I do that uh, almost every day. Like this morning, I, I went on my bike for an hour. Um, it's part of my, my habitual routines now. And I think, um, you know, for me, that's, that's one way that I achieve balance. I, um, if you ask my wife, um, she would say I'm horribly out of balance <laughs> most of the time. Um, but for me, you know, I, I think it's it's the fact that you know it's a it's a very joyful profession that we're in, and um, it's so exciting. Uh, you see it uh, uh, at Lenox Hill, and we see it here. There's just um, so many facets to this job. The research is great. The writing is fantastic. The operative challenges are huge. Uh, the the effects that you have on Patients are enormous. Um, as a chairman now, you know, there's a whole other set of uh, mountains to climb with philanthropy and with building buildings and new programs and recruitments and so forth. So um, it, it really is a thing that pulls you deeper and deeper. And the, the sad thing is if you're, if you're good at something uh, and you do quality work and you have a unique perspective on things, then um, the work just keeps piling up because people want more of you. So you really have to be careful. I think the, the um, Spetzler, I was with Spetzler when he, some Raj Narayan of all people asked him how he maintains balance. He goes, there's no such thing. Um, I think it's a good answer actually. I mean, I, it goes to the, the thing of we, when you love what you do, that's, there's no, that's your life. I mean, this is not, a, this is a job, this is really a job. I don't feel like I'm going to work. Yeah, I go home, but I, I, you know, there's no, this is our lives that we, we, we experience. And I, I enjoy the time here as much as I enjoy time and no matter what I'm doing for the most part. I mean, I, I'd almost rather do this than, you know, I love going vacation, love going skiing, certainly kicking your ass in the ski slips is always fun. But, uh, but um, I, I just enjoy being here. 
And uh, if, I, I, the, the biggest advice to balance is making sure you enjoy your work because it's, it's impossible to balance if you're unhappy at work. Then you're, and if you're doing something that's not fun or not at least mostly fun or you're challenging, and if you're chasing the wrong things, uh, then balance is thrown off completely. And like you said, I think what attracts us is the excitement of work. And then you have to work on reeling it in a little bit to maintain those most of the most important relationships that you, with your friends and your family, for sure. You guys have any thoughts on that, Yaffle? I, I agree. I think that we should, um, we should have a balance. I mean, otherwise it gets tough with our wives, I think, in <laughs> particular. <laughs> but I actually had a question for Dr. Lawton. When it comes to your advice to the younger attendings, um, obviously we all want to do, you were talking about number of cases. I think when you come out of training your first few years, they're just dying to do more and more cases. I mean, the more cases you do, the better we feel. And I'm sure that you and, and obviously David probably at some point in life uh, felt like that. So what's your advice on how to kind of start uh, conciliating that attitude with a more attitude about how do you cultivate your leadership skills? How do you cultivate teamwork in this environment where you at the same time just want to do as many cases as possible? So we'd love to hear your comment on that. Yeah. And I know so, that David loved that topic as well. Well, so here, here's my answer and it probably won't be the best answer, but it's the truth. Um, for probably 10 years minimum, maybe 20 years, I was an absolute, um, I was consumed with my cases and doing as many as I possibly can. I wanted to do more aneurysms than anybody I could, uh, anybody I ever met. And um, uh, I was absolutely, um, I did everything in my power to, um, to get those case, cases and the numbers way up. And I think um, um, that's just like this voracious appetite because um, I knew that the more I did, the more I saw, the more experience that I could collect, the better I'd be. And that was just this quest to be the absolute best. And, um, and I, I don't know that I'll ever let that go. I mean, I'm still, when, I, when I'm only doing three cases a day, I feel like something's wrong with me. And, and so it, it's, a, it's a disease that is hard to get over. But I, I will say this, um, now that I'm uh, on the other side of 50, I, I feel like um, you start to see life in a different perspective. And um, you start to realize that um, these choices that you make from here out have serious implications. And to do another case or to do another thousand cases, whatever it is, um, it's more of the same. And like right now I'm starting to think, well, there, there's so many other things that I uh, never really got a chance to explore. It's like what you said about leadership. Uh, I was so consumed with the thrill that I didn't really care about leadership. But now, you know, um, I, all of these other passions are coming to light. And I've realized that, um, you know, you, you can have uh, an even bigger impact on <coughs> your community or the world um, by doing these other things, by building a program, by um, inspiring a generation of young neurosurgeons, by um, writing a book that hasn't been written about something that's maybe even non-neurosurgical, by learning to paint or play a musical instrument or whatever it is. It's... Um, I think you start to realize that um, you're on the clock and those des decisions that were so reflexive when you were 32 and in your first year of practice now have real implications. And um, if you go do another uh, 500 case year of vascular neurosurgery that you're going to deprive yourself of that great American novel or that um, that mountain bike trip that uh, I can take Langer on and watch him fall over his, uh, his <laughs> handlebars and crack his eyeglasses again. <laughs> no, I, I, my, I, I have hard, it's hard. Uh, I think making a transition to, from what you're talking about to, and like Jay just and I had a conversation about this last week. Uh, there's, there's, there's an, you, you wanna make the effort and you wanna be valuable on one on, on, as a surgeon as a neurosurgeon but you also know that you have a responsibility to the greater good in the group and to something bigger than yourself and you know making that transition uh, is a constant challenge especially because we're all ambitious and all like to do great things and, and what attracted us to 
our fields to begin with was the beauty of neurosurgery or the beauty of interventional neuroradiology and the excitement and that charge of uh, you get out of these things. And I read a little a book uh, called Ego is the Enemy, which is, I think, just a terrific book for anyone who's looking for these sorts of guideposts. But the, 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 the paragraph, which I, I could read, but I'll, I'll paraphrase it, was that leadership requires that you give up some of the things you like to do. That we all, you know, that that's, and that really is the essence of it. You know, you, you can't do all the things you like to do because you know what, the next guy, they like to do those things too. And so you, that's, that's the hard part because as you withdraw from that, you sometimes have some self doubt or you know, maybe I should be doing that or maybe they won't think I'm any good at this because I'm not doing it anymore. And I think that, um, and as you, all the other, the other thing is this Einsteinian uh, uh, thing that, you know, you're, that, um, that ego is one over knowledge that, you know, as you get, move on, you know, your ego, my ego is not tied up in the cases like it was, or I had to be that guy that was doing those cases. I've, and even moving away from that. So these things have to happen. Some people can't do it. I mean, I, I had no, I had exactly zero mentors that did that, zero. And um, that was maybe why it was hard. I mean, you had, you know, had Mitch Berger. I know that uh, I'm, I'm sure you guys have had uh, different mentors in your lives, but without that, without those people, it's, it, it's very, you can, you can be on a flywheel. It's going to be, can be really hard. And so that, that's why when you're moving for the students, you have to look for a mentor. You have to look for someone who has a track record of, of attracting people and, and, and feeling like they can, they can make you better than what you'd be without them. You know, because we all work hard, and uh, I think that there there is some that doubt that can creep in if you don't have those things. And in fact, there's a question here about how do you deal with the negative mental health impacts of self doubt, and was there a time during residency where you felt burnout or uninspired? And I'll throw that hat and said, how do you overcome that? I remember Mike, you gave a talk once on treating basilar aneurysms, and the uh, we we've, we've had a, 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 a over back and forth over this over the years. I think you mentioned that, that uh, I remember hearing you talking about this feeling of, 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 um, of stress and anxiety about that. Maybe you could uh, expand on that a little bit. Yeah, um, so before I go to that, I just wanna make a couple comments because um, you bring up so many great points there. Um, the, um, I, I've been thinking a lot about people like uh, Sanjay Gupta, like Ben Carson, like Henry Marsh, um, th these are neurosurgeons who have um, um, gone on uh, to something beyond neurosurgery, outside of neurosurgery, and um, have found a way to have a larger mark on the world. Their, their impact has grown beyond um, their subspecialty or what they intended uh, at the beginning of their careers to do. And, and I find that really inspiring because um, I think ultimately um, when you get to the position that I'm at or that Dr. Langer is at um, and you just play it out, it's a plateau and it just continues flatly into the future until some point where you retire. Whereas these other guys have taken some transformative step that's allowed them to, um, to do something that's bigger than um, where they were going. It, it almost takes that plateau and bends the curve upwards again to another arc. And, and I, I think that is a really um, inspiring thing. And, and I also have been thinking a lot about um, this concept of, um, you know, the, the um, other thing in your career that adds purpose, you know, that there, there's certain things that we do um, that become a platform um, but then they lead us to our true cause in life. I think Bill Gates is probably the best example. He, he became you know, a founder of, of Microsoft, but in the end, as he's matured, his true passion is to cure disease in the world. And um, the whole focus of, of um, his uh, philanthropy uh, foundation is to cure malaria and now um, these other viral diseases. And I think um, you know, this idea that that we begin at some point, and then there's this underlying cause that we discover that um, really um, stirs the soul. It becomes our true passion, our true cause. I think that's that's um, something that we all need to consider, and I think that's probably what happens. At some point, you transition from 
that insatiable desire to do case after case to realizing that there's something else out there. And we, we all need to look in inward and try and find that. Um, now about the, uh, the Basler aneurysms, yeah, it's a fascinating story. Um, and I, I, I love to think about this because, um, you know, if you take the hardest thing that we do in neurosurgery that has absolutely no margin for error, and you know, you ask yourself, well, why would you even want to do that? Um, it, it's like um, these ancient Greek uh, mariners that uh, are trying to, you know, uh, sail into that that trap and find a way through it. You know, we 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 somehow get uh, uh, pulled into that, and and this whole idea of um, trying to work it out and to um, uh, deal with um, the mortality that we cause, the morbidity that we cause. I, I think um, part of what is so interesting about that, just philosophically, is that um, you know most most of the world gets good at something. You become competent. You become very skillful. You can predict your results, and that that's what 99% of the world wants. But I think there's this strange 1% that is really um, repulsed by the the status quo and, and this normalcy and that they constantly need to explore they need to find um, new ways to you know to climb that mountain to to clip that basilar aneurysm without any morbidity or whatever it is um, and I, I think um, that's the explorer mindset they're just I think some people uh, who have it and most people don't um, I uh, my wife tells me that I have it and I think it's true like if I if I go out and ride the same bike trail uh, 10 times, I start to get bored and I, I start finding new trails. It's, it's I think, um, part of the wiring that uh, makes some people uh, these constant explorers. But, um, but um, it, it's a good thing. I think it's, um, it's one of those things that keeps us um, searching for uh, innovation, searching for ways to make contributions, searching for that, um, that second cause in life, whatever that may be. I think there is always doubt, you know, I, I, I think especially when you're training, I always, you know, you want to be the best and then you, you, you learn from someone and then you reach your sort of the plateau of what you could do and, or you, then you try to get better. That, that's part of what makes you better. If you get, if without the anxiety and the stress, um, you're never going to improve. Everything's easy and everything comes to you naturally, then you're just going to make, you don't, you got to push yourself to get better. The question is in our specialty, <laughs> It's almost an endless, you know, there's almost no limit to what you can uh, expose yourself to. And I think the conversation I had with you was about this, this, this the, the one of the cases I was gonna show, which I, I probably won't have time to do now, but the idea is when you do have a complication um, and when you think you do the right things. And I, you know, I think one of the great things about our team is I know that if I have a complication, that the guys around me feel that my pain and they and I, that makes me better because I know that I, I don't have to worry about you know some jerk, you know attacking me for doing the wrong thing, but that and that's where it all starts. See, that's why to get to be the best you can be, you've got to be in a situation that allows you to do those things, whether it's a mentorship or the environment, because people get taken down by failure, or you know when we're in a when they're especially when they're in a competitive environment. Uh, and it needs to be competitive, but it needs to be friendly. You know, Roth and I have a very, I don't, we're not really competitive anymore. I don't, we've never really been competitive, but we tease each other. And there, there's an element of, you know, understanding what his skills are and how unique, unique, uniquely talented he is. And then, you know, I know he feels the same way about me. So, you know, and, and we've both had, up our, had complications, but I know in my heart that if I do, he's not going to think of me any differently. In fact, it's the opposite, the same way with him. And that's the way same with Yoff and with, with Jason. That th those are the keys to, I think, allowing yourself to, you know, ex you have to experience failure and you have to experience really fucking up because it just, it, without that, you're not going to make yourself better. And um, it's a very diabolically challenging thing. And I think that's why a lot of people aren't, it, are, never succeed in getting to probably where they could go. And I, you know, hopefully that's where we all, that's what we're all going to accomplish here. I really hope so. Hey, Dr. Lange, um, regarding leadership, you, you said it was not something, at least early in your career, that uh, you sought and that really you were focused on um, clinical excellence. How did, you, um, how did you learn to become a leader? Did you at some point 
make a mental transition that uh, this is something you need to be, or was it um, something that happened naturally? How would you describe that? Yeah, I, I think, um, uh, I don't think you can sort of um, just become a leader. Um, you can't flip the switch. I think uh, um, it comes from um, uh, a lot of what we have been talking about, wanting to um, transition to something else that has, uh, that, that gives me an opportunity to have a bigger impact. And um, as I made that transition and decided to go for a chairmanship, um, and then I realized I needed leadership skills. I went to um, the Harvard Business School, um, you know, crash course in the chair, uh, the chairman's course, and um, that was eye-opening. I um, essentially just um, learned, have learned on the job, and I've done some reading. I've, um, a lot of this is sort of self-taught and learning through mistakes and through some successes and listening to people who've advised me. I think. Um, you know, you become better at the leadership um, game by just um, throwing yourself in and wanting to learn. It's, it's, I think, in many ways, like the way that we throw ourselves into the operative, operative arena and learn to become surgeons. Um, um, some people um, have some natural skills that help them as leaders, the charisma, the speaking ability, the ability to tell jokes, whatever it is. Um, you know, th there are some... Um, uh, other skills that you find within yourself that you just um, really didn't notice before, but were there. And um, uh, I think that's the fun part about it is that, um, you know, uh, um, David mentioned failure. Uh, I also think that um, this whole idea of stirring the pot is really important about, you know, um, when you fail at something, it stirs the pot. It, it catalyzes change. It gets you thinking. It makes you re-examine what you did uh, on a case. Um, but stirring the pot can also be, you know, like, wow, what, what, what can I say to motivate this audience? Or what do I do with this resident who is underperforming? Or um, what kind of vision do I want for this institute that I've been entrusted with leading for, for now? Um, th these are the kinds of things that really um, awaken stuff inside of you. And I think um, part of uh, what I've enjoyed is that, um, you know, I didn't really consider myself a born leader. Uh, and um, as I put myself in this role, I've realized that I, I can do uh, a lot of the leadership stuff pretty good, and I feel really comfortable at it. I didn't view myself as a, as a born surgeon when I started as a, as a, a medical student. In fact, I felt very uh, under average when I started, and, and you know, I, I just threw myself in and, and kept walking down that path one step after the next. And, um, Part of it is just doing that, um, making that decision that this is a new phase of life and you're going to commit to doing that phase and being uh, the very best you can be at it. And then you just go and see where it takes you. There was one uh, quick thing I want to make sure we, we mentioned. There's a question about diversity in neurosurgery, which is slowly improving. Um, but and in fact, we are having a uh, talk next Wednesday uh, at 8 a.m. by a couple of our women neurosurgeons that are part of our group in the West, Western region. They're at Staten Island, which is part of our regional structure. They're just two terrific women neurosurgeons. There was fair, there was actually, so not, no one's called criticism, but kind of when the show came out, like where are the, where are the women? And I think it's a, it's a valid criticism. Um, I think that uh, especially neurosurgical leaders uh, we need women leaders and we need, and part of it is that people ask, and I'm sure this audience, how did you choose neurosurgery? To me, and I'm sure it sounds like you too, you saw somebody you wanted to be like. And, and so if, without women leaders, but with really talented women neurosurgeons, it's, it's not impossible, but you, you tend to look, look at people that are more like yourself sometimes. And not that I don't look up to some women, which I, I probably do in, in many ways more than some of the men I've encountered, but having uh, women leaders is going to be important to continue to encourage young women to come to our field. And in fact, they'll be more sensitive to some of the unique challenges that women entertain in order to accomplish the same things that, uh, that we do. And so it's important for us to both be open to it, but also be sensitive to the fact that 
there are unique challenges to being a woman in, in, in this business or really any medical business. And I think hopefully uh, Ronit uh, Galad and Sarai Motavala next week will um, uh, answer some of those questions for the audience. I don't know if you have any thoughts about how many residents are in your program or, or women. Uh, what, what's your feeling about how we do better at that? Yeah, um, so... Um, having a bunch of daughters helps. What's that? I said having some daughters helps. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I have three daughters and um, out of four children, so I, I appreciate the importance of that question. Um, it, it is really important to um, diversify. Um, I do like where things are going. If you look at medical schools around the country, they're half women now, uh, probably more than half women. So I think it's only a matter of time before uh, the ranks in neurosurgery fill with women and um, other underrepresented, underrepresented uh, minorities. I think it's, it's just, again, a matter of time, and it takes years for that to to happen. We, we have uh, 28 residents in this program. We're the largest neurosurgery program in the country. Uh, we have four women residents and they're all phenomenal. Um, uh, you know, I think um, um, it's, it's, a, it's a real um, responsibility, I would say, on the leadership, the leaders of today to try and encourage them to not only go into neurosurgery, but to to be real successful and to, more importantly, have what they would consider to be normal lives. I think for so many years, um, to go into neurosurgery meant to abandon the hope of a normal life. And um, I, I can remember so well, um, the first woman surgeon that I met, uh, it was at Hopkins and it was in general surgery. And you know, I had tremendous respect for the surgeon. She was um, one of the toughest surgeons I ever met. But, um, you know, she wasn't a normal person. She, she was um, very um, far from the norm. And I think what we need to do is not only attract um, diverse talent uh, that represents women and other underrepresented minorities, but also ensure that they make it through um, um, uh, as fulfilled, normal, uh, happy human beings. And, and that's as important uh, as anything. And so, um, yeah, I think it's. I think we got our work cut out for us. It's moving in the right direction, and uh, you know, I think it's only a matter of time. Well, I agree. I, th I think also think part of the, unfortunately, the DNA of neurosurgery. You know, our guys who trained us came from a completely different world. The types of surgery they were doing, when they operated, the tools they had, the imaging they had. It was a horrible field for the most part. I mean, you know, there was a there was you know tremendous even in the like the early neurosurgeons who took these huge risks and did just were exposed to just terrible outcomes. And I think some of our, this kind of cowboyish, egomaniacal, you know, lack of empathy, just full steam ahead came from, if you had those, those, those traits, you, you'd succumb to them. It was just, it must've been horrible. I mean, I, sometimes I'm in a yeah. case like an AVM. I'm just, I, I can't imagine guys trying to do these cases without the tools we have. Like what could they, what they could they, what they must've seen. And so, you know, that's maybe part of it. That now we're in a totally different field. It's finesse. It's, it's minimally invasive. People do so much better. You can actually be a human being. And, you know, the the, the you know, there are always going to be bad outcomes, but they can affect you differently. And I, I think that may be part of it too. Why it's more open to people that have a little more balance than just uh, this kind of militaristic thing. Yeah, it's it's interesting to think back on um, when I was interviewing when when you and I were interviewing for medical school, even. Even as a as a male, um, the, the it almost felt like if you went into a program married, um, that would <laughs> that was perceived as something that would decrease your your productivity or your work output. And um, to to take that feeling and to impose that on a woman who um, maybe is in um, those critical years where she's interested in the family, I mean, it's just a totally different entity. It's a quantum quantum leap. What, Roth, maybe you want to talk about how you, uh, real quick, how you uh, decided to become a neurointerventionist, because that's a whole, whole other, you know, a little different than what we went through. Yeah, yeah so, so um, my background, uh, when I went into medical school, I, I wanted to, I knew I wanted to be a doctor since I was a kid. 
um, but I thought I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, I loved sports, I played sports, and uh, I thought that was the field for me. Uh, having said that, when I go to medical school, I did not have great uh, surgical mentors. I did not. And uh, that, uh, what, what I did have was amazing professors of neuroanatomy, uh, uh, amazing professors of, of neurology. And I got attracted to neurology. Um, I, I went to medical school in Puerto Rico and I came to Thomas Jefferson University Hospital in Philadelphia where I did uh, meet Elliot Mankell. He's one of the old school uh, neurologists. He described PML. He described uh, um, many of the uh, demyelinating uh, lesions of the brain in the 1940s and early 50s uh, with Adams and Victor in, in, in Mass General. So, so he was the chairman uh, of neurology uh, Jefferson, and he was definitely a, 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 the person that identified in me the potential to, to, to be able to, to be a leader and to be able to be a, 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 a good doctor. Um, when I started my uh, neurology residency, I realized that there was something missing there. I, uh, I, was, I, I needed more action, that's the word. Uh, when, <laughs> when, uh, you certainly uh, got that, brother. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, fortunately, in my hospital, uh, there was this uh, uh, young neurosurgeon at the time that was, had, had trained uh, in interventional neuroradiology, Robert Rosenwasser. And my, the, I, I had a, my, my good friend, when I was a first year in Raleigh resident, was the, the chief resident of, of, the, of neurosurgery. And he told me, maybe you can do a, a rotation with Rosenwasser, okay? I, I didn't know who Rosenwasser was at the moment. Uh, my first day during the rotation, I, I realized this is for me. This is what I like. This is, I need to find a way to become like this guy. And, uh, and I did multiple rotations with him and, and uh, I was passionate about it from, the, from day one. Uh, and fortunately, that led uh, to different paths uh, until I ended up uh, uh, meeting Alex Bernstein and uh, who actually is gonna join us next week uh, in this webinar. Um, uh, so Alex Bernstein, uh, one of the founders of the field and and people that do what we do, all of us know him, um, was definitely the, the person I wanted to be like uh, in, uh, in that industry. Uh, the way he took care of patients, his experience, his knowledge, the way he thought about uh, the disease and the way he performed the procedures. Um, and he became my mentor. Um, during that time, that's when I met uh, David because David was the young uh, uh, open vascular neurosurgeon of, of the practice. And, and that uh, created uh, something special because as time went by, and David mentioned this earlier about our relationship uh, for students and residents, this is something invaluable. This is uh, what we have been able to, to achieve as, a, as partners has been something uh, unique extremely rare um, and, and not everybody is as fortunate as we are to have each other. Uh, we have a partnership, we have a teamwork, we complement each other and complement each other in skills, personality, age, and, 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 and all of that uh, comes into play for us to be able to achieve our common goal, which is to help each other so we can help more people. I think that the show in Lenox Hill showed a lot of that about the core of that concept in, uh, in our department. Uh, but at the end of the day, that's uh, the, for me, it is a, an amazing ride. Uh, and, uh, and I wish more people can have this fortune to, to, to be able to work with someone in this capacity. Or overall, uh, we'll make good decisions, I suppose, and some, after making some bad ones. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, our, um, our Insta live feed ends in about five minutes. Um, I'll, I don't know if the awful or Jace, you want to uh, mention any, any thoughts you have before I turn it back over to Michael? No, I think it's just, just, um, just a little bit about um, me coming here. Um, coming from Miami and joining this practice, I think the fact that we can have such a multidisciplinary approach to vascular disease, me coming from a radiology background, Raf coming from neurology, you and Jason coming from neurosurgery and being really experts in open stuff, I think something really unique. And I think we really benefit from that. And, and I don't know if Dr. Lawton would want to finish by commenting on, on the multidisciplinary approach for, for, and for vascular neurosurgery right now and how the field you know, has changed over the last you know, 10, 10 years or so. Yeah, um, it, it's changed to our detriment. Um, I think that um, for someone who loves clipping aneurysms and doing open microsurgery, um, you know, the, we, we peaked about seven or eight years ago and the numbers have been falling. It's uh, incredibly discouraging to um, have uh, spent 20 years hammering it out, writing papers, writing books, uh, demonstrating good work, building reputation, and to see that um, my case volume today is uh, less than it was um, seven or eight years ago, at least for the aneurysms, um, uh, it's disheartening. Um, but, um, you know, um, that's, that's a sign of the times, and um, I think it um, is one of those things that um, gets us to kind of pull up from the, the salt mines and, and absorb the bigger picture and um, look at some of those leadership opportunities, look at ways that you can disrupt the field um, to make changes that um, will um, uh, impact the way that uh, open vascular is practiced. I mean, I, one of my um, sort of uh, lasting campaigns or crusades is to make sure that this doesn't go away. I mean, even though our numbers um, are dwindling and um, there are fewer and fewer of uh, the pure open vascular phenotype out there, I, I really have um, been committed to try and get people to see that this is not going away, that it needs to remain, that we need to maintain proficiency, we need to focus on technical skill. Um, it's probably what drove most of us into this field to begin with. Um, we didn't go in because we wanted to uh, manipulate catheters. Um, most of us went in because we saw a brain pulsating in somebody's open skull, and we saw what it was like to dissect an aneurysm or resect a tumor. And, um, and that's the magic that makes neurosurgery. And um, you know, I've always felt like um, if we don't have keepers of that part of our heritage, that it will quickly vanish because there are some incredible forces on the other side, um, on the market side, on the um, uh, industry side, on the consumer side that are really um, uh, making it hard to continue. But, um, you know, um, uh, I, I still feel like um, that, that service that we do, you know, to do a bypass that can't be done with a, uh, an Alana technique or some stapler device, um, that really complicated recurrent giant Basler apex aneurysm that um, will no longer take another stent or a flow diverter, uh, I mean, there, there really is a role for, for some open vascular neurosurgeons in this environment. And um, that's what I hold on to. You know, I think um, um, that's really uh, uh, the niche that I try and fill. And um, I think it's uh, an incredible niche to be in. Um, it's, it's so instructive. It catalyzes a lot of the other stuff that we do on the open side. And, um, you know, I, I'm good with that. I thought I heard you mention, Dr. Lawton, that uh, since you've moved to the BNI, your uh, tumor case volume has started to increase. Do you feel that um, that is the way of the open vascular surgeon to also sort of supplement what they do with, with tumor? Yeah, I, I think there's a couple of models that you can uh, adopt. One is the hybrid endovascular open. The other is the um, uh, hybrid uh, open uh, skull base surgeon, the micro neurosurgical model. Um, I've tried them all. You know, I did an endovascular fellowship. I've done a skull base fellowship. 
um, I've um, I've just come <clears throat> to the uh, conclusion that you know my greatest strength and my greatest interest is in micro neurosurgery, and so um, taking out acoustics and doing uh, meningioma surgery at the skull base that that to me is in a, a completely consistent with what I've been doing my whole career in the vascular side. So uh, yeah, it, it's a bit of a hedge, you know, as the as the annuals numbers drop, um, I can easily pivot to that other. Um, and so uh, it, it definitely fills uh, a little bit of that emptiness that um, has been created by the endovascular competition. Mike, we, uh, I, think we, I think we just lost our Instagram feed after an hour, so uh, we can end here. But I do want to, I think the last thing, uh, we actually had 987 viewers uh, total on Insta, so we, I think hopefully that was impactful. And I think what I what I'd 20, like to, 21 on uh, Zoom. Yeah, 21 on Zoom. I just want to say that, um, and I think I don't know. I think I've told you this before, but um, I'm just incredibly <coughs> proud of you. Um, and when I think of uh, myself, you know, I know how ambitious you are. I know how competitive you are, and I know how hard charging and how much work you've put in. Uh, there's no better expression of that than your books and your the videos and the efforts you've made. But it, to me, it's not a threat. I mean, I think some people are threatened by that. I just, I just celebrate that. And I think that it's, uh, we're lucky to have you out there. Um, it's, uh, it's, just, it's just great to have you as a friend and a partner in this, in this business. And um, I, I appreciate you taking the time. But what's great about these virtual things, we do, it's a lot easier to do than it used to be. Um, but uh, you're, you're a great dad, you have terrific kids. I know you're you and your wife have gone through some tough stuff and you've been there for her and you're doing it. And I'm, I'm sure after hearing you today talking about um, these other guys, I'm sure there's more in store because you're not the kind of person to uh, let, you know, let those guys surpass you. That's just not who you are. And uh, maybe this Netflix show got, you know, that'll, that'll stimulate you a little bit, <laughs> but no, yeah, we I I, I have to admit, I'm, I'm horribly jealous of you right now. <laughs> uh, hard to do, seriously. I mean, what? It's hard to do. <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, the, 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 it is just incredible. Uh, the uh, the uh, celebrity that you've achieved overnight, it's its remarkable. But I, I will say this on a serious note. Uh, it's too bad that uh, this is only being shared by the 20 of us or so. But... Um, <laughs> I, I, I feel very similarly about you. Um, uh, there, you are what I would call a bellwether for me. I mean, there's some people out there who I, when I need to see where I'm at, I, I look at, okay, what's this guy doing? What's that guy doing? And um, it helps me to kind of gauge where I'm at and how I think I'm doing. And you're one of those guys. Um, uh, I, I can say that about you as a neurosurgeon. I can definitely say that about you as a skier. Um, I'm not sure I can say that about you on a mountain bike. <laughs> no, definitely not. But um, in, in all seriousness, I, I, um, I, I think you um, uh, are one of those guys who motivates me um, because I look to see what you're doing and um, I'm impressed and um, uh, it, it, uh, it goads me forward and I um, really like that about us. And, but more importantly, um, you know, um, the, we, we all work so hard that it's hard for us to have time for friendship. Um, I think um, we get home late, we're out of gas in the tank um, and we don't have a lot of time. And um, so it's hard, I think, for a lot of us to have um, many meaningful, deep friendships. And you, you've been a, an amazing friend. I don't know how it started. I don't know why it started, but for some reason I, I, I cherish it. It gets better all the time and I look forward to all the times, whether it's just a drink or a ski run or whatever. And I, um, I just want you to know that you, you're one of those really special people for me. Well, thanks, Mike. It means a lot. Coming from you means a huge amount. So and I, I feel the same way about these guys. And I know that they were, uh, are equally as, uh, you know, honored for you to be with us today. So thank you. And hope, and my wife says hi to Sophie, by the way. It's yeah. Favorite. Well, send my regards to her. And by the way, you're, you're coming on our, uh, our grand rounds next Friday, not this one, yeah. but the following. Yeah, I'll, I'll be there. Have yeah. some some treats in store. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk before then, though. But thanks again. Thank you for joining us.
Mm. Yeah, thank you guys. And I'll, share the case. I'll share the case another time. <laughs> yeah, we need to see that. All right. See you, okay. bud.